You know, you should think about it every now, every now and then because even if you're not a victim of financial crime yourself, if somebody you know or somebody you love or even somebody that's making a big fuss on, on social media is, you are going to start thinking about these things. You're going to think about what is my bank doing, not just to protect me, but in the fight against financial crime at large. Because if us or any other bank does not do a good job in here, we're effectively allowing you know, crime to be funded, you know, drug cartels and human traffickers and all these things that are not the, necessarily the first result of financial crime, but are where things end up. And, and that's why it's our job to improve this for society at large. So with that said, please give a big round for Natasha Vernier, our head of financial crime. Hi everyone, I'm Natasha Vernier, Head of Financial Crime. And as Simon said, I'm here today to talk about why it's everybody's business. Uh, but first of all, thank you so much for coming. I can't believe how many people are here on their Saturdays. Blows my mind, but thank you for coming and I'm glad that you're as excited about Monzo as we are. So to start with, uh, raise your hands if you've ever been involved in any financial crime. More than I imagined. Okay, keep your hands up and raise your hands if you've ever smoked weed or done cocaine. Maybe audience cam off for a bit. Um, okay, how about if you've been to a car wash and paid with cash? More than that, surely. And how about if you've got a cleaner uh, and they're, they're not English and you pay them cash and you've not checked their legal status in the UK? Okay, so everyone who raised their hand at any point, and those who raised their hands in their minds as well, um, you've been involved in the financial crime life cycle. So I think financial crime is the most important conversation that nobody's having. And my aim for this talk is to try to persuade you about that. So the first thing I want to do is talk about why people commit crime. I think that's a good starting point. Uh, this is the statistics from the Office of National Statistics uh, from 2018, and it shows of all the crimes reported, um, what were they and what percentage were of those particular crimes. So 19% uh, of the crime reported in 2018 was theft. When I look at this list, I see a common theme. The ones that I've highlighted here that make up 70% of those crimes reported, I think, are for financial gain. So I think that about 70% of crime is for financial gain. But actually, there's an underreporting problem because the Home Office tells us that actually only 17% of fraud committed is actually reported. So if you normalize that fraud number, which was 11% uh, for the fact that only 17% is reported, you end up with a much, much larger number. And actually, 43% of crime committed is fraud. We also know that these crimes, human trafficking, sexual exploitation and modern slavery, they're vastly underreported. Often the victims are not possible, not able to report it. And bribery, again, um, the victims might not know their victims until a long time after the event. So these all go very underreported. So actually, what I think we end up with is about 80% or more of all crimes committed are for financial gain. So that's step number one. I think people commit crime for financial gain. On to step two. What crimes are criminals actually committing? So we know that people commit crime for financial gain, but what do they do when they have that financial gain? Contrary to some popular television shows, they don't actually just go home and put it in the washing machine or stack it inside walls of their house. They want to use it, just like you want to use the money that you earn. And this is where we welcome financial crime. And this is often where people get a little bit bored or a little bit confused, or sometimes a little bit of both. And it's not really surprising. I mean, the FCA says that financial crime is any kind of criminal conduct relating to money or to financial services or markets, including any offense involved. I'm bored. Wikipedia is not much better. Crime committed against property, which I find really confusing. If I go home and punch my pillow, am I committing a crime against my pillow? I don't understand how crime can be against a property. This is Monzo's definition of financial crime that I wrote about three years ago, and I find it confusing. So financial crime is confusing. So I, I asked the team, actually, a couple of days ago, I said, if you were going to explain what financial crime is to your granny, what would you say? 
Lizzie actually said it's how bad people stay rich, which is pretty accurate, but not very specific. Uh, and Catherine has actually asked her granny this, and she described it as it's about the money that people have got from crime and then what they do with it afterwards. And I think that's pretty accurate. So I think a, a good definition of financial crime is that it is using the financial gains from your crime. Um, we then got a little bit excited and started talking about predicate offences and victimless financial crime, which we'll come on to. Um, but then Lizzie said something, this last sentence, this is the point that I, I was trying to get to. So basically, all crime is financial crime. So, so basically, all crime is financial crime. I studied maths and further maths at A-level, but I was never any good at it. And uh, the only reason I passed was because my best friend actually gave me all the answers. Um, but I've come up with an equation. I'm going to call it the financial crime equation, and I'm very proud of this. So I think that most crime is for financial gain and the use of that financial gain. And as we've just learned, the financial gain plus the use of that financial gain is financial crime. Therefore, most crime equals financial crime. You're welcome. If all you take away is this, I'll be very happy. So given, given what we know, given that most people commit crime for financial gain, I think that what we're really saying is criminals commit financial crime. So on to step three. How should we be fighting crime? So if this financial crime equation, which I'm going to keep showing, um, is true, if most crime actually equals financial crime, then all we really need to do is some really good root cause analysis. So if, if people are committing crime for financial gain, sort of if we are trying to tackle how that crime manifests itself, you know, the, the fraud, the theft, the violence, we're not actually tackling the root cause analysis of that crime. Because criminals are not loyal to theft or to burglary. Criminals are loyal to financial crime. So I'm just going to take a moment and say that I am not trying to undermine the work that law enforcement do. I think they do a fantastic job. We work with them on a daily basis. They do a fantastic job at fighting crime on the streets with far too little money. And I think they do a really, really good job. I'm not trying to take away from what their work. But what I'm suggesting is that they have a thankless task. I think that they are being told to fight the wrong thing. I'm arguing that the root cause the thing that they should actually be fighting is the financial crime. And I want to talk through three facts, which I think explain this better. So the first fact is that we're not very good at fighting financial crime. The second is that we're pretty good at fighting how that financial crime manifests itself. So the fraud, the theft, the burglary. But it doesn't matter. And then third, I'm going to talk about the scale of financial crime and how it's growing. So fact number one. The United Nations Office for Drug and Crime, they estimate that we currently seize 0.2% of all illicit financial gains. 0.2%. We are 0.2% good at fighting financial crime. That's really, really bad at fighting financial crime. So, you know, if I steal 100 pounds from you and I'm a criminal, we're currently giving you back 20p of that. That's really bad. So we're currently really, really bad at fighting financial crime. Fact number two, uh, we are pretty good at fighting how that financial crime manifests, but it doesn't matter. Criminals are not loyal to this. They're loyal to financial crime. And I'm going to talk you through a case that we had at Monzo to help explain this. Uh, back in 2018, we had some point of sale refund fraud. I'll explain what that is. So um, the point of sale machine, which is the machine that you put your card into when you go and pay for anything, uh, criminals would go into shops or restaurants and they would steal these machines, put their cards into it and process a large refund for themselves. So we identified this and we reported it, as we're supposed to do. And a couple of weeks later, law enforcement got in touch with us and they sent us this still from CCTV footage at a sofa shop because they thought that these four men behind the counter uh, were possibly carrying out point of sale refund fraud. And we were able to use the information that we have about our customers and the intelligence that we have to positively identify these criminals from the CCTV footage and tell law enforcement, actually, yes, those are the people who were doing the point of sale refund fraud. 
And what they were doing is they were going in and two of them were asking the shop assistant to show them some sofas, whilst the two others grabbed that point of sale machine and put through some large refunds. But the interesting thing was, this, these four men, this crime gang, they were very, very well known by law enforcement, but they were well known for selling drugs and for violence. This crime gang, they were not loyal to selling drugs. They're not loyal to violence. And actually, they're not even loyal to point of sale refund fraud. They're just loyal to financial crime. So I think when the law enforcement are told to go out and stop crime, stop fraud, stop burglary, stop drugs being sold on the street, they're just being, they're just playing whack-a-mole. If all that we're doing is seizing 0.2% of those illicit gains, then they're just going to find another way to do it. Three, the scale of financial crime. It is growing. 360% increase in phone scams. 260% increase in modern slavery. 240% increase in elder abuse. 16% increase in fraud in the UK. Financial crime is a one to two trillion dollar industry globally. And that range is huge, which means we actually have no idea how big it is. It's probably much, much bigger than that. And it's growing every year. So the facts are that we're very, very bad at fighting financial crime, that we're quite good at fighting how that crime manifests, but it doesn't matter, and financial crime is currently growing. So we know that most people commit crime for financial gain, and we know that really criminals are committing financial crime, and so what we really need to do is be fighting the financial crime. How on earth do we do that, though? So I think there are two reasons why we don't currently do this very well. I think the first reason is that we don't understand it. And I think the second reason is that there is an assumption that there are no victims in financial crime. You'll hear that a lot, it's a white collar crime, no victims. Lack of understanding, hopefully, with my financial crime equation, you can have a little bit more of an understanding about what financial crime is and how it comes about in the world today. And if anybody says to you that there's a lack of victims in financial crime, they are just wrong. And we're going to talk through that now. So when criminals commit things like uh, theft or burglary, or if you're subject to a fraud attack and actually you have your business life savings stolen from you, it's kind of obvious who the victim is. The person who loses the money is the victim. But when things like you know, drug sales or, or human trafficking or modern slavery happen, it's really hard to then sort of identify and pinpoint where those victims are. But there are always victims, because the point about criminals being loyal to financial crime is they'll find any way to make money, even if it is taking somebody, literally somebody, their body, and selling it to somebody else. Of course, they have no right to do that, but that is what is happening. So I'm going to talk through some cases as well here. Um, you may have all seen this headline a couple of weeks ago, 39 Chinese nationals were found in the back of a refrigerated lorry, all dead, having been trafficked to the UK. I don't know any more about this than you do. I don't know what they were being brought to the UK for. But there is a high chance, it's highly likely, that they were being brought here to work on things like illegal marijuana farms in the UK. So when you smoke your weed at the weekend, just think about the journey that that has taken. Somebody because marijuana is illegal in the UK, somebody has had to work on that farm. And there's a high chance that whoever was working on that farm was there against their will. Probably they've had their passport stolen. They're being locked in a room when they're not working. And they're working literally to survive, to be fed. And then if you go to the, the person actually selling the drugs, it's not fun to be standing on the corner of a street selling drugs. And it's, you're out in the middle of the street it's very obvious, police are looking for you, there's a high risk involved, why would people do that? It might be that that person is actually a drug addict and is trying to pay off a debt, and they're being treated as a criminal when really they should be treated as a victim in this whole scenario. And there are definitely victims in the drug chain. And if you just look at the numbers in Mexico, 31,000 murders in Mexico, and that's compared to 730 or so in the UK, I mean, that number is huge. And the vast majority of that will have been due to the drug cartel wars that are in Mexico. 
And you look at the opioid crisis in America, largely caused by Purdue Pharma, who, who created OxyContin. They were doing false advertising. They were paying doctors to oversubscribe drugs. And they were giving doctors coupons so they could give patients 30-day free trials of drugs. In 2015, the amount of opioids prescribed in the US was enough to keep the entirety of the US completely medicated for three weeks straight. I think those are crimes. They feel like crimes to me. And it's not surprising that 130 people died every single day in 2016 and 2017. There are definitely victims in this financial crime. And the same is true of human trafficking. So 40 million people are in modern slavery right now. And what that means, what modern slavery means, things like forced labor, so 25 million people are in forced labor. So on that marijuana farm, literally being kept there, somebody has taken somebody else and sold them for financial gain, and that person is now being kept in a locked room, being forced to work. The other industries that this is common in, car wash, construction, 15 million people in forced marriage, usually women, but literally they're, they're being sold by somebody who has no right to sell them to somebody else, to be married to them. It's mind-blowing and disgusting. And 5.4 victims per 1,000 people in the world are in modern slavery today. There are definitely victims. And we've seen this at Monzo. This is a, a, an ad that we found on a site in Romania. And that number at the end there was for one of our customers. And this ad was advertising for somebody to come to London and work as a masseuse. And we found similar ads. They were advertising office jobs or bar work or female-only leaflet distribution in London. Don't know why you need to be a female to be a leaflet distributor in London. And what we think was happening was that people were applying for these jobs thinking that they were actually coming to London to be an office worker. And then they were being taken against their will, having their passports removed, being locked in a room, and made to work either as a, in the sex trade or some other kind of forced labor. And we were able to plot, this is from our data, we were able to plot a driver as they came from Europe to London, and we think that this person was trafficking women to the UK. So when anybody tries to tell you that there are no victims in financial crime, you now know that, that is absolutely wrong. So, we understand it, and we know that there are victims. What can we do about it? So if you own a business, I would really like you to have a think about who you're employing, even right at the bottom end of your supply chain. I would like you to think, are you doing all that you can to educate your customers and your employees, and do you know who you're really working with? Who are the companies that you're working with? Who are your suppliers? All that information is really important, and it is absolutely one of the things that you should be caring about. You, you can't pass off that blame. Well, it's not my company. It's just a company I work with. You absolutely have the right to inquire about their practices as well. And as an individual, what can you do? So this is why I think it's the most important conversation. I think that we should be challenging our politicians, our local politicians, our national politicians, to talk about this. They talk about fighting how this crime manifests. They talk about fighting fraud and burglary. But as we know, that's not going to solve anything because it's not the root cause. The root cause is financial crime. We need to push for better regulation to tackle this. So in banking, for example, uh, we need to have better regulation to enable all banks to communicate better together and with law enforcement so we can try and seize more than the 0.2% the 0.2% that we're currently seizing. If you want to take drugs, go somewhere legal. And you look at, the, look at the stats. If you go to places like Portugal or places in the Nordics, America, the number of deaths by overdose is dropping so much since it's been made legal. And you then know that the people who have grown those drugs all the way through to the people who distribute them, they are doing so of their own free will. And you can educate yourself and others. There are some really, really good books that you can read. McMaffey is a great book. Dope Sick, great book. And tell others what you know. I think it's really, really important. So we know most people commit crime for financial gain. And we know that really criminals are committing financial crime. 
And we also know that we need to solve this by fighting financial crime. And we need to start talking about it. So I think financial crime is the most important conversation that no one is having. I'd love to know what you think. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, absolutely fascinating talk. I think we all learned a lot there. Um, just a quick announcement. Now is the time for our first break of the day. But because we are running quite a bit over schedule, rather than giving you guys like two equally sized breaks, we thought we'd extend the first break and, and shorten the second one. So uh, the next talk is now going to start an hour from now at 2.30. So feel free to go and eat and have some lunch and enjoy yourselves. And be back here for 2.30, please. Thank you.